Hello, I'm Oliver Culling, and this is my 70s TV childhood. Welcome back to what is probably the world's leading, if not the only, podcast on growing up as a child in 1970s Warrington and the importance of television in that childhood. It's lovely to have you back with us. And if you're listening for the first time, then really pleased you managed to find us. The world is a big place. Our planet is just one of countless heavenly bodies in who knows how many solar systems and galaxies the thought of which starts to give me a headache sometimes. The size of our own planet is enough to impress me, never mind the infinite vastness of the entire universe. As an educated, affluent society, we try and bridge those distances by travelling, or at least we do in more normal times. And through that travel, we experience different cultures, people and ways of living. Many of us develop a passion for discovery, and travelling to new destinations helps us learn more about this world in which we live. The other way most of us learn about the rest of our world is through the media, and particularly the news media. The whole way that we receive and evaluate news is very different now than it was for past generations. The internet means we have access to a vast, unordered, and sometimes pretty unreliable source of information at the touch of a phone screen. Friendly arguments are settled in a flash by someone googling the answer to a query and quoting what they find on Wikipedia as evidence that they are right. Whilst we still have print newspapers and magazines, more and more content is now available online, with most newspapers now gaining new readers for their digital editions rather than print. The whole concept of what makes the news and what news is has changed dramatically over the last 20 years. And while we once relied on occasional radio or TV news bulletins to inform us, we are now bombarded with news, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 52 weeks a year. There are a whole range of rolling news TV channels, like Pioneer CNN, Sky News and BBC News. You can also choose which type of flavour you prefer for your news by watching alternatives like Al Jazeera, Russia Today or Fox News. I often feel like there is too much news and I do sympathise with those who say I never watch the news as it's so depressing. Whilst it's great there are so many choices of news programmes to watch I can't help feeling that they sometimes deliberately create news stories to fill their 24-hour day agenda. Are we better informed as a result? Well, perhaps. But I also think that we now live in a world where serious news events don't always have the impact they might have done in the past as we've become inured to sensational headlines or stories. In recent times, our screens have been full of violent incidents in the US and endless images of suffering from the global, seemingly endless pandemic. When these stories are repeated again and again, they become less effective in making a point, and more likely to leave us feeling sad and depressed, and feeling that the world really is an awful place. All of this seems to make the world a bit smaller, And I'd like to spend this episode looking back at how my appreciation of what the world is about was shaped during my early years in the 1970s, when news coverage was certainly less in volume than today, but perhaps had much more of an impact. So let's leave Sky News, Fox and Al Jazeera in the 21st century for the next 15 or 20 minutes or so. I remember how we used to get our news. As a small child, your world is a very small one to begin with. It exists around you rather than you being part of something larger. 
your parents, siblings, relatives, and those around you are your world. And as a baby, then a toddler, you're trying to make sense of it all, as well as trying to make sure you get fed and are kept warm. I have early memories of lying in a cot, playing on the living room carpet, running round in the garden, all of which are simple and uncomplicated. But soon, once our basic needs of safety are satisfied, our natural curiosity begins to take hold and we start to take more interest in the world around us. Going to nursery and then to infant school broadened my experience and I think the big thing for me in accelerating my curiosity was learning to read. Once I could read, there was so much more I could learn and discover. Thinking back to the early 70s, I remember picking up reading pretty easily. My efforts at writing were less successful, and anyone who's seen my handwriting can tell you that I never quite got the hang of it. In spite of being taught to write with a fountain pen, as we all were at my school, and following the platignum, well, at least I think that's how you pronounce it, round-style writing program, which was very trendy at the time. I think I must have been quite a serious child, as well as an inquisitive one, as I did take to reading the newspaper from an early age. In our house, we had two newspapers, the Times for my father and the Daily Mail for my mother, something which wasn't that unusual at the time. Both papers were large, broadsheet editions, and my parents would both sit reading their respective papers at the breakfast table. When I say it like that, it sounds like something from the Victorian era, when it wasn't really like that at all. Well, anyway, my mother proudly told the tale that from quite an early age, I used to read the Times from cover to cover every day. She even repeated the story at my 50th birthday party. I'm not sure that it was entirely true, but I do remember finding lots of interesting things to read about in the paper, and it shone a light into a big world out there, which I barely knew existed. Thinking about it a bit more, I was quite serious-minded over some things, as well as being a hopeless television addict. I remember discovering an old primary school project a few years ago, You know, you probably had to do them yourself. Once a term, you had to choose a subject and do a project. Well, this project was an in-depth account of Jimmy Carter's successful presidential election campaign of 1976, complete with my own interpretation of why he'd been elected president. It was accompanied by lots of cuttings from the Times, complete with handwritten explanations of what Jimmy Carter was doing at certain times and why. I don't remember what the other nine-year-olds had as their projects, but I think it's a reasonable bet that mine was the only one analysing the US presidential election. As well as newspapers, books and magazines were a great window onto the world. We'll talk about television's approach to news in the 1970s in a moment, but I do fondly remember a brilliant source of all kinds of learning, and that was a series of picture cards and albums issued by Brookbond. For those of you who don't remember, Brookbond used to run a series of collectible cards on different subjects, which came inside packets of tea and tea bags. My Auntie Elsie, well, she was my father's aunt, so technically she was my great aunt, really, used to collect the cards for me and my sister and filled up the albums, which came with each series. I still have some of them, and I'm looking at some of them now, and I have to say they are hugely impressive. They were all educational and covered subjects like trees in Britain, British wildlife, prehistoric creatures, kings and queens, oh, and the history of aviation, which I loved as it was full of aeroplanes. My absolute favourite, however, was the race into space, which I've got here. Looking at the front, the album cost five pence or a shilling, So it must date from the early 1970s, and it really is a thing of beauty. It contains 50 cards, all of which were stuck in by Auntie Elsie. And it has an introduction by Patrick Moore of the Sky at Night fame, and takes us through the whole history of space adventure, from Sputnik through to the planned Viking missions to Mars, and what living in a space station might be like. 
One of my favorite cards, number 50 of 50, speculates on a future manned mission to Mars. And here's what it says. America's plan for a manned expedition to Mars involves two nuclear-powered spaceships, each carrying six astronauts, launched, according to one plan, on November the 12th, 1981. Reaching Mars on August the 9th, 1982, each vehicle would orbit the planet for 80 days, while unmanned probes, followed by three men from each ship, would descend to carry out scientific research and collect samples. During the return to Earth, landing on the 6th of August, 1983, the expedition would fly past Venus to observe the planet and use its gravity to reduce speed. Well, it's a shame that didn't quite work out, Um, and particularly those very exact timings of when we were going to land on Mars. But to me as a young boy, this was amazing. The space race was a very 1970s thing, and this album captures that excitement perfectly. I've never really thought about it until now, but Auntie Elsie must have drunk an awful lot of tea to be able to fill up all of these albums. Only now do I see it as her labour of love for her great niece and nephew, and I imagine she roped in all sorts of family and friends to help. So thank you, Auntie Elsie. Which brings us on to television. About time, I hear you say. Like so many things we've already looked at, it was a bit different in the 1970s. To start with, there was a lot less news coverage than there is now. The whole idea of a channel broadcasting 24 hours a day was alien to those times, never mind a 24-hour channel dedicated to news. So what do the channels do? Well, let's start with the BBC. BBC One carried a news bulletin at lunchtime, usually read by one of the heavyweights, Richard Baker, when he wasn't doing Mary Mungo and Midge, of course, Kenneth Kendall, Robert Dougal, or Peter Woods. There was also an early evening broadcast at 5.45, after the Magic Roundabout, The Herbs, Rhubarb, or one of the other five-minute filler programmes. And then there was an evening news programme at 9 o'clock. The style was very sober, and almost sombre, particularly from the craggy-faced Peter Woods. And when these newsreaders spoke, you had to listen. News was serious. It was there to inform you, and you were expected to watch and listen. If you missed it, there was no instant rewind, no repeat of the headlines on the half hour. You had to listen. And even as a child, I took notice of what these wise men said. And yes, They were all men until Angela Rippon appeared in the mid-1970s as the first regular female BBC newsreader. The newsreaders were held in high regard and greatly respected by most viewers. There was never any thought that what was being shared was anything other than the truth and the concept of any sort of bias or, God forgive, fake news never crossed most of our minds. So what about ITV? Well, ITV had their own news company, Independent Television News, or ITN, and their bulletins had a very catchy theme. Essentially, the ITN bulletins were similar in style to those on the BBC during the day, and often featuring Leonard Parkin or Gordon Honeycomb, the slightly suave and awfully well-spoken newsreader who was immensely popular during the 1970s. Where they differed in their approach was later on. The BBC had introduced their 9 o'clock news bulletin as a direct response to ITN's News at 10, which provided 30 minutes of serious, heavyweight news which I remember being captivated by on the occasions I was allowed to stay up and watch it later in the 70s. The presenters of News at 10 were pretty heavyweight too. Alistair Burnett clearly meant business. Sandy Gall looked every inch the war correspondent he was. 
and Reginald Bosenkate always looked like he'd either just been involved in a brawl or was about to start one. Even as a child, I wondered about his slurred delivery of the news, and it was only later that the widely held suspicions that he was, well, let's say a bit of a drinker, were confirmed. But whatever he did or didn't do, it worked. In the late 1970s, he regularly appeared with Anna Ford, another heavyweight, but this time female newsreader, and their on-screen chemistry was very popular. She recalled in a 2007 interview that, Reggie was a dear. I mean, you wouldn't have chosen a man who had epilepsy, was an alcoholic, had had a stroke and wore a toupee to read the news, but the combination was absolute magic. The news, as presented by both BBC and ITN, was an event. Families sat together to watch whatever was their preferred bulletin, and we listened, otherwise we missed it. For me, the television news showed me things I could never have imagined and brought to life far-off places in a way which I didn't get from reading about things in a newspaper. But the news wasn't just national and international. No, it was very local as well. On the BBC, the news magazine Nationwide came on after the main news bulletin. It was hosted by Michael Barrett, who, rather disconcertingly, looked just like my primary school headmaster, Mr Smith. Half of it was national news with a slightly offbeat or whimsical focus, and the second half was a local news programme. Growing up in Warrington, that meant Look North West, hosted by the legendary Stuart Hall and John Monday. ITV's answer to Look Northwest was Grenard Reports with Bob Greaves, Bob Smithies, and the legendary Tony Wilson. It was a bit more trendy, tried to be a bit more hard hitting, and was extremely popular and influential. Now, you've probably seen the film Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy. Well, in the Northwest during the 70s, Stuart Hall had a similar profile to Ron. He was something of a demigod striding tall across the region. Not only was he the host of It's a Knockout and its European equivalent Je Sans Frontières, he was also a football correspondent and the main anchor for the local news. Always smart, always witty, and with a great rapport with his viewers. It's a shame that subsequent events spoiled that memory, but that, again, seems to be a common theme with many of the things we try and recall on my 70s TV childhood. The final programme I want to highlight was something very different. Both BBC and ITV stroke ITN provided a rather serious and sombre approach to news which I found engrossing, but as I said earlier, I think I was quite a serious child. News was not for children. No, they should carry on watching the programmes designed for them and not be interested in adult news programmes. But the reality was that children were increasingly interested in the world about them, and on the 4th of April 1972, something quite revolutionary happened. John Craven's News Round was the first daily TV news bulletin in the world aimed specifically at children. It has run in one form or another ever since, although sadly John Craven was ousted many years ago. All of a sudden, children had a news programme which didn't belittle them or seek to exclude them, but was aimed at explaining what was happening in the world, in their world, 
in language they could understand. What I liked about Newsround was that I never felt patronised. The incredible John Craven, who also helped create the idea as well as being the show's presenter, managed to convey news stories of all kinds, from the most serious to the light-hearted, in a respectful way, with just the right balance of explanation and reporting. I remember learning about things like the Cod War between Britain and Iceland, seeing the first flights of the supersonic airliner Concorde, and countless other big stories from John Craven. I'm sure that I'm not alone in thanking John for that. His efforts in creating a news programme for a growing, inquisitive generation of 1970s children will not be easily forgotten. To sum up, I think what demonstrated the high esteem in which TV news and its newsreaders were held the best were the Christmas editions of The Morecambe and Wise Show in 1976 and 1977. In the 1976 show, Angela Rippon appeared and started off sat at a desk reading the news before kicking away the desk to perform a full high-kicking song and dance routine. So what, you may say, in these days of Strictly Come Dancing and Dancing on Ice, etc.? Well, that sketch caused a national sensation, with lots of comments in the newspapers, and some outrage because newsreaders shouldn't do things like that. Any remaining semblance that newsreaders shouldn't do things like that was completely smashed by what happened the following year when a whole gaggle of newsreaders, if that's an appropriate collective term, appeared with Eric and Ernie singing There Is Nothing Like a Dame. The group even included Richard Baker and Peter Woods. So the age of the sombre newsreader came to an end at that point. I'd love to hear your memories of TV news in the 1970s, or on anything else we've covered in previous episodes. You can let me know on our blog at www.my70stvchildhood.com. Tweet at 70stvchildhood or you can email me oliver at my70stvchildhood.com. That's all for now. Take care and I look forward to seeing you again soon for more from My 70s TV Childhood.